mama say a prayer for me I need a touch from Getting dark, too dark to see. I feel like I'm knocking on heaven's door. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Knock, knock, knocking on. And Jesus saved me like he said he would A long black cloud, it's coming down I feel like I'm knocking on heaven's door Knock, knock, knock on heaven's door Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door Knock, knock, knocking on Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to preach on the cornerstone tonight. We've been preaching, we've been using the seven dispensations, and all they are is ways to line up the Word of God to study it. There's nothing about the dispensation that's a secret or you figured out something new and fancy. It's just a way... You can divide the word of God up so you understand the period of it from the age of innocence on, on, and on. We're in the church age right now, and I've been preaching the last several services up on the church, and I'm, again tonight I am because I was talking to Pastor Gary, and I talked to Dave, Pastor Dave over here, 
we could preach on the church till Jesus comes and not get it all preached out. Amen. But if you if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Psalms 118, 22. Everybody knows this passage, but we're going to start there. Hallelujah. 118 and verse 22. And my wife ain't back there, right? I'll make sure I don't say nothing back there. Really what the problem is, Dan's been mad at me since that happened that night. For you that wasn't here, I want to say, baby, I thought my wife, and I didn't see her sneak out. Well, his wife is back here. He said, I didn't mind you saying it, but she expects him to say it all the time now. <laughs> Amen. Dan takes a beating around me. I don't know why he hangs out with me. <laughs> you the worst. <laughs> Amen. Psalms 118, verse 22, and the Bible says this. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Now flip over to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28, and we we'll read one verse there, verse 16. Actually, yeah, read one verse 16. And the Bible says, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone, hallelujah, that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. Wow. Wow. I could just preach on that verse right there, but let me lay something down to you as I get going here. In the ancient times, in the biblical days and stuff, the practice, they, they, what they did when they was building, the cornerstone was the principal stone that they built upon. It had, it, this thing, it, 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 was, it was big, it was, it was strong, it had no weaknesses in it because the structure that they built was built upon it. Today's we pour footers. You know, we put rebar in because we won't do it. It's not as hard on the back and pushing a big old stone around. So we dig trenches and footers and we'll we'll get concrete and rebar in there so we can build upon. If you don't have a good structure, and any of you guys work construction, and I got a bunch of boys that goes all over putting up towers, if you don't have your concrete right, I don't care how pretty that antenna looks going up there, that tower. Or how pretty the house you build up on that land, if you don't have a footer, it can't stay there. It can't sustain storms. Now, I remember going back over in Giles County with my, with my granddad as a little boy to his farm and everything, and you go by these old houses, and I'm talking about old houses. I mean, they were 100 years old when I was a kid, and, and they'd have rocks that set, they set it up on level the house with. It was amazing how they stood the test of time but I asked my granddad, I said, how do them rocks hold it together? He said, what's well, not sitting in? We're just leveling it up. He said, there's bigger rocks that they put down in the ground back in the day. Now, I didn't know this about the Bible back then. You know, I was a typical kid. But I was so impressed that it had a big old rock down there in the ground that you didn't see. But you've seen these little rocks. Some notes out here. <laughs> Hallelujah. But they used the most solid and the most carefully constructed program, or blueprints as we call it nowadays, to build. But then when you turn it over to the spiritual realm, and here's where we begin to lay a foundation to preach hard. Jesus himself described himself as the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone of the church. Now I want to explain something. There's a lot of division and there's a replacement theology going on, in, especially in the church of America that I hear preachers all the time saying the church has replaced the Jewish nation. I beg your pardon, it hasn't happened. Amen. They're still God's apple of his eye. They're still his people. And because of Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary, I'm about to get ahead of myself, but because of what he did, he come to build his church. Last week I talked about why he was here. And now I'm telling you that the church is why we are here. Amen. 
See, when we go through life, you get born, these young little babies, all they do is scream and cry. Well, that's how young Christians are. They just scream and cry. They just want that milk. But then they get into adolescence years. Come on, parents, help me out here. Those adolescent years that some kids have to wonder they're going to make it out of it. I got one now. She's worried. She, don't, she can't see the light at the end of the tunnel right now. But because teenagers are stingy and selfish because it's all about them, what they want. We all been there. Don't act like you ain't been there. Look, some of you act like, I never did that. Well, not, not only was you stingy, you, you carried a, a trait of being a teenager liar into adulthood. Ooh, that hurt, I know. But let me tell you something. That Christians are the same way. They get in that adolescent stage of Christianity. Their prayer life is this. God, what you got for me? Me, 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 me. You know, and then, then this new age church in America is all about prosperity. Well, God, I need a Rolex. Well, God, I need diamonds. I need the best clothes, God, the best car. Send me to the prettiest church where I look like I'm important. I want the church that's got the best reputation in town. God forbid don't send me that old biker thing that looks like a saloon. I've seen them walk out, and God, I know they was drunk. Yes, ma'am, I was getting to that point. <laughs> They're not drunk as you suppose. But them bikers ain't the scared of the Holy Spirit. But see, so much of the church is in that adolescent stage. I need a new Nintendo. I got to go to Myrtle Beach and get a new game. I'm picking Wayne. <laughs> he, he does these games. She told me to say it. She sent me a note. But I do want a pinball machine soon. You find one. Amen. I want the one with the Harley Davidson on it. Amen. It has nothing to do with the sermon. Just trying to do a little business. But let me tell you, in the adolescent stage, it's all about self. What self wants. But in adulthood, adulthood, you get married. You grow up. And you have little rug rats. <coughs> Don't get mad at me, parents. I'm sure you called them far worse. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. A lot of repentance going to go on tonight. But, but you begin to reproduce. It was what the commandment was, that we should plenish the earth. Amen. But what happens in the, adult, when you're in the adolescent stage, you don't want to reproduce because you know every dime you're working for goes to that thing going to be in the room with you. My, my little girl was, thought she was sick last night. I just laid down to watch Blue Bloods, my favorite show. If you ever had a show that wanted to turn you into Catholic, it'd be that one, but I still love the show. Don't get mad at me saying that. I ain't knocking the Catholics. But it's always that two-finger job. That everybody, man, them guys got it made. They can drink like that. And it, never mind. But anyways, I heard her hollering. Mom can't go with her when she's going to, you know what. They holler at the old man. It don't bother me. You should have chewed that up better. It wouldn't have been so bad. But, but anyways, but she never did do it last night. I'm sitting there beside her. She's crying. I said, what you crying for? You ain't done nothing yet. Well, I feel like I am. <laughs> anyways, she didn't get sick, thank God. But we as adults, we have to leave our adolescents behind and Christians we need to leave our adolescents behind and begin to reproduce ourselves by sharing the message of Jesus Christ with everybody we come in contact. Because, see, the church, Jesus Christ, when he died on Calvary, he paid the price for the church. Amen. And when he paid the price, then there was this great commission before he lived. He said, listen, guys, I want you to go into all the world and preach this gospel. We can use it from Genesis to Revelation, but he literally is talking about himself. We need to preach Jesus Christ crucified. 
We need to lift him up on that cross while we preach because the power of the cross is what is still sending out the conviction power that the coming to the altar is getting saved by. Amen. It's through the blood of Jesus that our sins are worked away. And let me tell you something. I love the applicator. Boy, nobody knows what I'm talking about. I didn't read about that. He said, listen, I'm going to leave the scene, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send another. And when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power. Now, let me read these notes because I'm getting off, getting ahead of my sermon a little bit. <clears throat> but Jesus himself described himself as the cornerstone of the church. And the church would be built upon him. But listen to this. He preached a unified body of believers, Jews and Gentiles. Amen? And he also, we also know that when you build the house upon the chief cornerstone, that the gates of hell cannot and will not prevail. See, there's a lot of organizations, a lot of churches pop up and go, pop up and go. What they're doing, they're trying to have something mimicking somebody else. And I've told so many preachers, you got to find out what God wants you to do, and you got to find out what God is blessing instead of doing something and begging God to bless it. Amen. Because when you do what God tells you to do, the blessings is going to be upon it. Your fruit's going to produce, and your fruit's going to remain. And people and the, and the devil cannot tear it down. They can talk bad about it. He can send attack after attack. But when you do what God's called you to do, and you stand up on that cornerstone, I don't care what kind of storm is thrown your way. I don't care what kind of spiritual hurricane or spiritual tornado comes. Whatever it is, you can stand on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ and you will not be moved because there's nothing in heaven or earth can move Jesus Christ. So the end time church that's finally coming alive in America, guess what? They realize it ain't about our stinking names over our doors. It has nothing to do with trash. It's just a cute title we use. It has nothing to do with being Baptist or Pentecostal or Catholic or Methodist or Presbyterian or what other stinking name we could come up with. It has everything to do with being a born-again child of God with your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You may not like all of this, but it's the only way to get well. Amen. <coughs> So go with me to Acts chapter 4, 11 through 12 real quick. <coughs> Acts chapter 4, 11 through 12. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 4, 11 and 12. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Now listen, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else. Hallelujah. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Here we are. We're building a church. We're working in his kingdom, not us. I'm talking about collectively the church of Jesus Christ. I ain't talking about trash. Here we are working together, trying to be unified. And if you go back to a few weeks ago, and I say this a lot, the Bible says we'll be, we'll be known by the way we what? Not believe, not work, by the way we love one another. That's just not in trash ministry. That's just not in the Pentecostal realm. That's in the unified body of Jesus Christ. It's not southern boys loving southern boys. It's not my northern brothers loving northern brothers. It's red and yellow, black and white. We are precious in his sight. 
Jesus loves the little children of the world. And if you profess to be a born-again Christian, then you best be loving your brothers and sisters. I don't care how much different they look from you. Matter of fact, you stand there, somebody looks pretty freaky compared to the rest of you. But you best find a way to love me if you plan on making it to heaven and if you plan on being in that church. See, he was rejected, but he became, he became the cornerstone. He, the, they, they thought they killed him. They thought he got rid of him. But let me tell you something. All they did, all they did was follow what God sent him to do. Did you think about that? I hear preachers get so mad who, who crucified him. I said, nobody put him on the cross. He laid down his life for Mike Price. Oh, the devil made him use a, a flesh to put a spike in his hands and his feet. But they didn't crucify him. He knew for what purpose he came. When he was looking down the e times of Eon, looking into Bassett, Virginia, and, and Collinsville, Virginia, upon this night. He said, there's going to be a ragtag motley bunch that's going to need me. They're going to need to be able to call upon my name where they might be saved. They're going to be able to use my name to defend themselves. They're going to be able to use my name to lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. They are going to be able to use my name and begin to prophesy. They're going to use my name and change a whole community just because they said, I love you back, Jesus. See, we made it so hard to get into good old boys club. Let me get on a quick rabbit trail. I'm sure they ain't got all them hot dogs cooked yet. Last week, I thought we had burnt offerings going on over there. Man, I mean, they was burning the bacon. And they even burnt, oh, sorry, Ted. I thought you went over next door to cook. <laughs> Jennifer told me to say this. I got her note right here. Here it is. She said, Ted's the only man could burn a flat pancake. <laughs> no, I'm kidding you, brother. Don't you be mean to her. But let me tell you something. Because Jesus came willfully, he knew what reason he was coming. It was more than being crucified. It really was. That is that his crucifixion paid our debt. His spill in his blood made a way to wash our blood. But if he didn't get up, then God didn't accept it. Amen. His resurrection, the way Father God said, amen, I accept it. Because in the stillness of Calvary of a contract they made. I'll preach that later. But, but he, he would come that he would set his church. Can you think about that for a moment? Thousands of years ago, he knew in the last times, in the last days, that he was going to raise up peculiar people. Let me say it Mike Price's way. He was going to put a whole bunch of weirdos together in the warehouse and praise him and run out them doors and change Virginia. But he knew he was going to be the cornerstone of the church. Now, if you can flip back to me, you ain't got a turn, but back to Nehemiah when he went before the king and he was sad. And you couldn't go in front of a king with a, a saddened disposition. He could have you killed. Couldn't you imagine if you had to always be happy to go see your boss? I doubt if I have too many bosses ever said to see me smile. You know, because the one part of the Bible I always remember reading as a kid, even though I ran from God most of my life, that we'd have to make a living by the sweat of our brow. So I, I worked and I made decent money, but I was always mad. Because my daddy said if Adam hadn't sinned, we'd be living in paradise, and here I'm working. Anyway, that's for free. But, but listen to this. When he, on the stillness of Calvary, he made a contract with his daddy for us. I've used this adoption thing before. 
the plan was adopted. Once you get adopted in the Jewish sector, they don't remind you that you're adopted. In America, they'll constantly remind you, oh, you was adopted, I forgot to tell you. You're not going to get none of my money when I die because you're adopted, you're a lesser, you're a cheaper cut. But in the Jewish nation, they want to adopt a boy or a girl, but just talk, use a boy right now. They get out on the public square. Come here, little Davy. Come here. Act like you were 12 again. Yes. <laughs> we kind of look like you. See how I'm dumb you look like me. See, you'd go in the public square. And they would tell, listen, he has no kinfolk to take him. I want to adopt him. Well, I mean, it's a split second thing. They, yeah, they adopt him. But guess what happens? Thank you, brother. When you becomes my boy, my son, they don't never use, he's adopted. That's right. Immediately, he's made joint heirs to the promise, Amen. to my wealth to my property, to my namesake, everything I'm about, he has access to it. Oh, y'all ain't getting this. Because in the Bible, he come for the Jews. The Jews, his own, didn't receive him. But, 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 don't think he didn't come thinking he wasn't going to get the Gentiles too. Because the Bible's clear, he come and shed his blood for all mankind. But they didn't accept him at that time. So he turned to the Gentiles. I'm not adopted. I hear preachers preach that all the time. I'm so glad we adopted. I'm not adopted. When I got saved, I become a son. When you got saved, you become a son or you become a daughter. You're not a second class citizen. You're not just adopted. There's no paper of adoption. And in the Hebrew language and the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, they never talk about the adoption after the daddy said, that's my son, my beloved son, and who am I pleased? So we as children of God, because he come as the cornerstone. But see, he came for his body, his church. And Christ was sent to save, heal, and deliver. And let me get to bring this home. Tell me one more verse. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. One more verse, and we're going to wind this thing down pretty quick. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 and 21. And the Bible says this. So now, you Gentiles, Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. Oh, my God. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. Ha, <laughs> You are members of God's family. Oh, my God. Verse 20, together we are, we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because here we go. We are the church. Amen. Amen. Listen. We are not left out from the promise. We are full heirs to that promise. Christ, he is the foundation. He purchased it at Calvary on the cross. Mm. On his resur mor resurrection morning, he, he lived again, and the body, his church, became a living vessel. Amen. It was powered upon the day of Pentecost. I didn't get no amens on that. It, the church was powered up on the day of Pentecost. You remember the story? Let me remind some of you. I guess we forgot. They was all gathered together. Amen. You know how Jesus preached that? You mean to tell me we got two together? Yes, ma'am. But they was all gathered together. And you know they were sitting around talking about Jesus. They were still probably missing him. But, Lord, something began to happen. It was like a mighty, sound of a mighty rushing wind that coming. And I ain't talking about from Russia. It sounded like a mighty rushing wind that come up on them and it filled the place. And they all became filled with power from the Holy Ghost. Amen. I don't know why the church is so scared to say, I've got the Holy Ghost. I don't know.
don't know why the church is so scared of the fullness of the Bible. I don't know why. But honey, let me tell you something. Jesus saved you. The Holy Ghost gave you some kick and some pump in this walk that we got. Amen. I hate being in churches. I don't like testimony services. I don't. Because most of them are satanic worship services. Oh, the devil been after me. <laughs> Sister, let me tell you, he's got you. <laughs> you keep giving him glory, he's going to own you. Then the guy gets up, well, bless God. It been a rough week. My old truck blew up. My car got a flat tire. Y'all need to pray for me. You need to get saved, Bob, and sit down. I don't like people testifying because it always goes downhill quick. And besides that, it's unbiblical. Let me go. Oh, I got your undivided attention. He never told us to have a testimony service in here. He said, testify, but take your testimony on the highways and the byways and tell them what Jesus has done for you. Amen. I don't need you tell you tell me what Jesus. I'm watching what Jesus is doing for you. And some of you I'm watching on you, waiting on you to let Jesus do it. Amen. My God. But listen to this. Listen to this. We was empowered at Pentecost. He was hated, yet he loves us. He was rejected, and we are accepted. He was broken, we are healed. He was crucified. We are justified through his blood. He died on a cross that we might live. He lives that we might serve him and never die. Oh, my God. Some of you ain't listening to this. You don't have to die in your sins. I hear so many people, Brother Mike, I just can't help it. I prayed and prayed and prayed. How'd you pray? The devil won't leave me alone. Let me tell you how to pray. Jesus, the name above all names, the son of the living God, the one that was crucified and died but rose again. Jesus, I'm welcoming you to my life. You live so I can live. Let me tell you, the devil ain't going to hang out very long because you say, Lord, Wash me in that precious blood. Turn that blood bath on and cleanse me and remove all sin and all bad habits from me. You won't have to come to church. Well, the devil ain't after me. You're lying. He ain't after you. You're just a miserable person. Get saved and get some joy in your soul. See, society has changed, but he's the same yesterday and the day forever. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Back in the beginning of the first verse, that we would not be shaken. We didn't have to be shaken. If you're grounded in Jesus, now stick with me here, we'll wind it down now. If you're grounded in Jesus, one, you won't be walking around with all these spirits of fear a lot of you people walk around. Oh, I'm scared I'm going to have a heart attack. Oh, I'm scared I'm going to get cancer. Oh, you, Brother Mike, you shouldn't drink them Diet Dews. It's going to give you cancer. Don't you speak that junk on me. I drink Diet Goo because they're good. I eat banana pudding because it's good. I like New York style cheesecake, not this phony stuff you get down here from New York. It's about this thick, about this big, about $48 a slice. But it's good. But see, you testify as Christian. You're going to die of that. Oh, Brother Mike, I think, I know you do because you already spoke it in existence. Oh, Brother Mike, the de- oh, yeah, I just feel so terrible. Yeah, you look pretty terrible too. <laughs> it's going to say where we live. See, there's a message to this. You're hung by your tongue. What you speak. That's power to it because you're supposed to be a born-again Christian. And what we say, it takes life. I'm not cursed, I'm blessed. I'm not sick, I'm well. I'm not lost, I'm saved. I'm not fat, I'm just full. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Woo. 
Boy, you boys better back me up now. <laughs> Amen. But see, we as Christians, we stand on a cornerstone. And Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. The author and finisher. He has the final say. So why you listen to the enemy? Why do you, why do you testify for the enemy? I hear this all the time. This is going to make some of you mad. A lady called me up one time. Lee, you're going to remember this. I called Lee and told him afterwards. The lady said, Brother Mike, will you pray for my cat? I said, no, I don't even like cats. That lady, don't, I doubt she speaks to me today. Because I told her pastor, he asked me, I said, listen, dogs are of God, cats of the devil. Everything God's got, the devil's got an invitation. Don't get mad at me. I never had the first dog crawl up on my heart and scratch the gas tank. But I've had several cats that did. <laughs> Do you think I act like a Christian that day? Of course I didn't. <laughs> I was going to baptize that cat. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and for getting my Harley scratch, you stay in here, you furball. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. I'm going to get hate mail from this. Somebody's like, Brother Mike, you made me mad talking about cats. <laughs> I will. I'll get some hate mail over this. I, I, I left church Friday night so mad because you talked about cats. Get a lion. Get you a big old lion. Roll out in the yard and play with it. He'll curl up with you. You don't see people doing that, do you? But all kidding aside, let me get some guys on the, music, on the instruments, please. See, a lot of people say, you shouldn't laugh in church. Why not? You better believe it. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. When you get saved, you ought to be happy. You want to give you a reason you should be happy. You're not going to hell. Amen. You ought to be happy. Were you glad when they said it's time to go to the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Did you enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving? Amen. See, it's something about getting your worship on. Now, I've had several people, Brother Mike, we're getting too loud. It bothers me. Well, hell's going to bother you worse. People are, it's why you always go there, Brother Mike. If you hate to worship God, you explain it to him why he ain't good enough for you to worship. Explain it to him. Explain it why you're too proud to praise, too cold to care. Amen. Because, see, I know where he brought me from. I know where he saved me from. There are shovelers in here that ought to be in hell. We sure enough paid a ticket for it. But Jesus loved us. And the least we can do is lift our hands up and praise Him. The least we can do is quit being ashamed of what He's done in our life. You guys said you was bikers. Well, we never had no pride in our old life. Come on, guys, help me. We rolled into town, show our rear ends, acted all this stupid, and we get Christians. Uh -uh. Are you kidding me? We've got something finally to talk about. All the BS we used to talk about wasn't worth talking about. We all laughed about it. But now we got the name of Jesus to talk about. <clears throat> we got a cross to talk about. We got a king to talk about. We got a heavenly father to talk about. We can thank the power of the Holy Ghost for being in us. We got a gift of eternal life to talk about. Our eyes have not seen or ears heard what he has went to prepare for us. We got that to talk about. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. You want to look around, you got brothers and sisters that love you unconditionally. Let's talk about that. Just talk about that. I can still in this country raise my hands anywhere and tell him I love him. I love being in Walmart and people ask me to pray for them. I love getting a hold of their hand in Walmart and begin to pray. I 
don't do it for a show. If I call you up and pray, I don't, you, don't need you to write a note and get to it in six weeks. I need a prayer tonight. But if you ask me, it must you have a need now. And the Bible says, well, two agree. Oh, my God. Y'all didn't get that. Well, two agree. He's already there, but you agree. God, touch her in the name of Jesus. Touch him in the name of Jesus. Heal him in the name of Jesus. Deliver him in the name of Jesus. Well, that's just too radical. That's right. Y'all had many bikes. You didn't have Harleys and Panheads and shovels. I know. Y'all had many bikes. Good, clean bikers. You rode Hondas. You meet the nicest people in Honda. Sorry, brother. Don't get mad at me. I like your gold wing. I like your trike, too. Is that a Honda? Yeah, I like her trike. She'd kill me if I don't. But you're sitting here tonight. This ain't going to take long. You say, Brother Mike, I just don't have the peace you're talking about. I don't have the joy you're talking about. I wish I could be, I guess this is the right word, uninhibited as I am. Man, I just let go and let God. What are they going to do? Talk about you? Who cares? Who cares? Because if they talk about you, you ought to live good enough, they have to use the name Jesus. He or she's a Jesus freak. If we live it like that, and you know what? As a Christian, I love this statement. We can love the hell out of them. I told y'all last week and the week before, I'm going to share it what, the third week in a row. My daddy prayed for me all the time. <coughs> He'd come to see me at my house. I was supposed to be this big bad biker. Slide that bong over there. Put that over there with the Ajax. Hope we don't get it mixed up later. I don't want him to see it. I had respect for him. But when I got saved that Wednesday night, he called me up and said, I want you to go to church with me. I know God opened my mouth because I didn't want to go to church. I'm in a new home. I got this easy chair. Through the living room, into the bedroom, it goes. And my bulldogs take off. And I go to church. Long story short, I got saved on a Wednesday. That Saturday, I was washing my truck. And I never let, my trucks get dirty now. It's because of Josh and all of them. They don't wipe their feet getting in. But anyways, I'm going to teach them how to wash it this weekend. But listen, my trucks were spotless. But I was washing it that Saturday after I got saved on a Wednesday. And this little cloth fell out. I knew exactly what it was. I grew up, my grandpa was a Pentecostal preacher. It was a prayer cloth. I walk into my house, we didn't have cell phones. We lived in freedom back in them days. I went to the house and called my daddy. Another thing, you know, I get tired of you people saying, you don't answer your phone. I don't carry a cell phone for you. I carry it for me. Got you? Roger. Quit sending me messages. Answer your phone. I don't carry it for you. But I called my dad up and said, Dad. He said, what? I said, how long you been had this prayer cloth in my truck? He busted up and started laughing. He said, it fell out. He said, ain't amazing. It fell out after you got saved. And he said, son, you've had them in every truck that you've ever owned. He said, you've had them in all your motorcycles. I said, where'd you put it in my motorcycle? Huh, boy, I took your hand grips off, put them in the handlebars. Really, Dad? But it worked. But it worked. So if you're in here tonight and you don't have the peace of Christ like you ought to have, would you come and let's pray for you? We ain't going to drag it out because I'm hungry like y'all. I didn't stop me on the way down here. I want me a burger, fry, and Coke. You say, Preach, I'm just, I don't want to walk up in front of people. Well, let me present something else to you. If you die in your sins, if you die in your sins, Gary, if you die in your sins, you're going to stand and walk in front of a whole lot of people. 
I ain't trying to scare you into it. I'm just trying to let you know. Eventually, you're going to meet Jesus Christ. Eventually. Why not now? Why not meet him when he can be your Savior? Instead of when he's going to be your judge. Why not now? Amen, amen, amen. Okay. As he's pray, we're going to let him pray. But I'm going to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I thank you for being here. There's a lot of places you could have been. Well, not really. We live in Henry County. Ain't a whole lot of places you could have went. I'm just kidding. It's my hometown now. I've been down here long enough. I didn't think I'd ever say that, Roger. Where you live? Oh, I live in Bassett. God sent me to Bassett. I didn't even know where it was at. I thought this weather had Bassett dogs. I didn't know about the furniture, but I did see the furniture on Prices Right. I just didn't know it was in Virginia. Sure did. But I love you guys with all that's within me. Pray for each other. Love each other. People ain't here tonight. Call them up and tell you love them. Shake each other's hands on the way out. Thank you for bringing the word through, Mike, Lord. We just ask you to give everybody safe travels home and give them a good week this week and let them remember why we're here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.